The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. I'm Anish, director of the Institute of World Affairs at UWM. It can be a daunting task to articulate more moral ideas for a multicultural and multilingual world. Documents like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights have contained, from the beginning, struggles over moral ideas and their translation across cultures. Does the idea of human rights mean what we take it to mean? To help us explore the question of moral ideas in a multilingual world, we are joined by a noted scholar of cross-cultural exchange in global history. Lydia Liu is Wunsun Tam Professor in the Humanities at Columbia University. Her research includes the exploration of the movement of words, theories, and artifacts across national boundaries. Professor Liu is also the founding director of Tsinghua Columbia Center for Translingual and Transcultural Studies at Tsinghua University in Beijing. Lydia Liu, welcome to International Focus. Thank you, Anish, for having me here. So let's begin with uh, one of the startling um, ideas that you have in your work, which is that when we think of human rights, you know, especially the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it's not necessarily completely a Western endeavor. Uh, there's something uh, non-Western embedded in there. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, um, sometimes um, you put a question to people about some evident truth is the idea of human rights universal or not? Is it a Western idea? Most of the time, the answer you get, like the answer I get from some of my students, would be, of course, uh, the idea of human rights is a Western idea. But then you push them, how universal is this idea? Is a Western idea universal? Then you don't get a quick answer there. Right. So, so when we think, and some people criticize that, uh, well, you know, any universal idea is going to be a uh, little oppressive uh, for people uh, who have different traditions, different customs, and uh, different uh, ways of looking at the world. And so universalism of human rights could never be completely universal in that sense. I see, uh, I, I see where that argument would be going. In fact, I heard a lot about that. I myself used to think that way until I came across some interesting uh, documents. Uh, uh, for example, uh, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was being drafted uh, between 1947 and 48, there was a, a, a group of scholars uh, who decided they wanted to write a letter to the UN Human Rights Commission to remind them that uh, the idea of rights and human rights might not apply universally everywhere. Guess who those people were? And those were anthropologists who represented the American Anthropological Association. So this letter was quite famous, and they addressed the letter to the UN, UN Human Rights Commission right they, when they were uh, drafting the letter. And I remember there is one paragraph in that letter which says, well, if you wanted to make the idea of human rights universal, you would have to be able to convince an Indian, a Chinese, an Indonesian, an African of its universality. So that was where uh, a very interesting debate about the universalism 
and relativism of human rights started. So, in fact, it started uh, right at the beginning, before the UN Human Rights Commission even came up with its first draft. And then, many years later, as you know, the Universal Decl Declaration of Human Rights was a moral uh, statement. It didn't have any legal binding powers. Uh, for legal binding, uh, legally binding documents, you would have to wait till the covenants to be drafted. But even many years after 1948, when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was approved by the Uni United Nations, there were still people who were asking these questions, especially, I remember in the, in the 1990s, uh, uh, some people uh, voiced skepticism about this idea from an Asian point of view. And this is a very well-known Asian values debate about what is applicable to Asia, what is not. Specifically, they were targeting human rights uh, claiming that human rights would not apply to them. Fascinating. Um, so you're talking about the debate uh, before even the declaration was drafted. Who were the key personalities involved in this debate, and what exactly was the debate between them? That is a very good question, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, I was going to say, uh, if uh, the the American Anthropological Association uh, had known who were sitting on the committee, they would have been surprised. And maybe they would have not written that paragraph I just mentioned. Um, there were 18 member states on the Human Rights Commission. Um, many of them were Africans and Asians, and some Latin American representatives. Among them, there was this small core group of people, uh, which consisted of, uh, consisted of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was the chair mm -hmm. of the drafting committee, and then uh, Charles Malik, who was a Lebanese representative. Um, with a background in philosophy. Um, he was also Christian, and he was the rapporteur of this drafting committee. And then the vice chair of this committee was the representative of the Republic of China. His name was P.C. Zhang. In Chinese, it's Zhang Pengchun. And he played a very important role in the whole process. And then the fourth person was John Humphrey, who was a Canadian legal scholar, and he also played a central role. And he was the he 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 was he was the represented the sec secretariat. So the four of them worked together, and two of them were non-Western intellectuals. And this is interesting because um, did you um, in your research did you find any disagreement between them? Um, because it seems that you know Universal Declaration of Human Rights came out you know with consensus and things like that. Uh, but was there any disagreement uh, among these gentlemen? Absolutely, the the disagreement also started before anything was written, and um, there was this anecdote which uh, was uh, recorded by John Humphrey, who kept a very good detailed uh, journal of what was going on from beginning to end. And also, Mrs. Roosevelt uh, uh, also uh, must have kept a journal because she wrote about um, the, their meetings and conversations uh, in her autobiography. All right, I checked both the journal of John Humphrey and also Mrs. Roosevelt's autobiography, because I was curious uh, to see how the whole thing started, whether they had any disagreements exactly as you were asking from the start. With the cast of characters that they brought together, like Charles Malik, um, a Christian, and uh, P.C. Zhang, who was a Confucian humanist, you would expect some kind of conflict. Sure enough, if you if you read uh, Humphrey's journal, he would 
tell you that in the spring of 1947, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt thought it would be a good idea to invite these core members to her apartment in Washington Square in New York, mm -hmm. just to have a casual conversation and see how things would go. Uh, she was not that sure if uh, the Human Rights Commission could succeed in its task. That was just you know, right after the Human Rights Commission had been formed. So one afternoon in February, uh, she invited uh, P.C. Chang, Charles Malik, and John Humphrey to her apartment for tea. And there the conversation started. And soon everybody, everybody noticed that Charles Malik and P.C. Chang were at loggerheads with each other. And that was really the beginning of their, uh, well, conflict, mainly over what ideas would be considered as universal. Charles Malik, for example, would say, well, according to Thomas Aquinas, you know, these ideas should be like this, whereas P.C. Chang would insist that uh, the commission should spend some time studying Confucian humanism before they could even come up with a reasonable, you know, ground on which they could uh, talk about human rights. And it's very interesting. So the two men then engaged in, in, in a heated debate to the extent that their f philosophical arguments com went completely overhead, uh, you know, as far as Mrs. Roosevelt's um, journal is concerned, because she s says in her autobiography that this gentleman engaged in such lofty debates about philosophical matters, and I couldn't understand any of it, so I continued to pour tea. <laughs> this, is, this is fascinating. So um, the main difference between them was about the universalism of human rights uh, and how they can be applied to different uh, countries and civilizations. Was that the main difference? And if it's even possible. So Confucianism gave certain different solutions and uh, Thomas Aquinas different ones. Is that right? That initial conversation signaled a major, major divide uh, in the very concept of human rights that would be debated uh, among the 18 members, member states those delegates who represent 18 countries on the Human, Human Rights Commission and later um, at the General Assembly. Uh, that divide, of course there were many divides, but main divide was whether they should uh, consider human rights as going back to a European natural theological concept, uh, in other words natural law, or uh, should it be uh, considered as universal in secular terms. So the main divide at that time, which will be reiterated in you know, session after session when they were debating about these ideas, uh, would then uh, a, a fall on uh, concepts like uh, whether human beings were created by God for example, uh, should they even entertain the idea of creation? Um, a lot of these uh, uh, debates really focused on either religious or secular understandings of human rights. And uh, P.C. Chang represented Confucian humanism. Since he was vice chair, he had a, a lot of power of, over, you know, where to direct the conversation. Um, on some of these very difficult points, he would then argue that uh, perhaps we, we could have a more pluralist understanding of human rights. Let's not exclude religious thinking. But then, on the other hand, your religious concept should not exclude secularism. It was very difficult to negotiate 
past that point. So let's, uh, we'll take a short break now, and let's, when we come back, let's discuss a little bit of uh, pluralism here, how much pluralism is there in, in human rights uh, after the break. Okay. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. So Lydia, we were discussing uh, the idea of pluralism uh, in human rights, because generally when we think of human rights, they seem so universalistic and almost in a singular way that they don't look very pluralistic. So you just mentioned that P.C. Chang was, was a pluralist. How was he able to influence human rights then? In fact, the person who applied this term to P.C. Chang was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, because uh, P.C. Chang insisted, uh, according to a lot of these uh, the archival materials, that uh, there was always more than one kind of reality, and one must be open to other possibilities, other than a theological argument. And so then uh, there are many, many uh, instances in the document itself that actually indicate how some of the other um, philosophical uh, traditions uh, found their way into the document. Although when you read the English version, you wouldn't see it. That's the most fascinating aspect of this document. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights today exists in f more than 400 languages. Um, once I was asked how one might teach this document, and I, and I said, if you have a room, like a class of students who come from very different language backgrounds, have them read the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in those languages, and have them debate on the meaning of some of the key concepts, you discover that they will have lots to discuss and debate about. So could you give us an example of, uh, let's say, let's take one translation, Chinese. Um, how different is the Universal Declaration in the Chinese language, and where do you see P.C. Chang's influence in there? Well, the, um, there is one striking uh, uh, aspect of his contribution that is mentioned by a number of historians who uh, analyzed the Universal Decla Declaration of Human Rights, uh, but not even so. Uh, some attention has been paid to his contribution. There's not a lot of detailed studies of exactly what happened on the page. And also, I'm very curious about uh, different drafts there was a Geneva draft, there was a Kassan draft. This Kassan draft was the draft that was uh, uh, written by the French delegate, uh, Honan Kassan, who later won a Nobel Prize in uh, peace for his role uh, in the drafting of the document. And there's the finalized draft. And I did some comparisons and some other scholars have also done the comparisons. One example that really comes out strongly is in Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in which um, uh, there is a word conscience that is juxtaposed to the word reason as two aspects of human nature, human beings are born free uh, in dignity. Uh, 
I forget exact uh, wording now. Uh, but conscience, this word, uh, was absent in some of the earlier drafts. And human beings were simply described as, you know, uh, having reason, with reason. And now you have with reason and conscience. Uh, so I got curious how, how this concept was added as a human attribute. And I read the uh, summary reports, uh, basically uh, the uh, transcript of the sessions. Uh, and then uh, I realized that P.C. Zhang pro proposed a Chinese Confucian concept, which is pronounced ren. Essentially, this character, written character, is made up of two semantic components, one for human, the other for number two. And uh, uh, human and number two together make up this moral concept in, in Confucian humanism. Some scholars translate it into English as benevolence, sympathy, but the difficulty was that P.C. Chang couldn't find a good translation because there was no equivalent at that time. And so he said, maybe sympathy, maybe conscience. And then the other people suggest, well, agreed, let's put conscience in, in, in its place. Um, now we read this document, we, re we don't realize that there's a Chinese character hid hidden behind it. Yeah, and, very interesting, yeah. uh, because the word conscience um, itself is, although it's, as you say, it's not an exact translation, it's a, but, um, but when we think of human rights and when they were formed, uh, the idea of human beings as uh, individuals, and there's, there were individual protections, um, and, and rational human beings, but the idea of morality uh, and their moralness was not there as much. So it seems that P.C. Chang's contribution to the document is that humans do live with others, I suppose. Absolutely. Um, the word conscience basically mm. indicates what is lost in translation. Because if you read it in English, conscience merely suggests, almost goes in, in the direction of Christianity, right? Mm, right. Um, so that's real mistranslation. But it's an interesting mistranslation. What the original Chinese character um, was uh, uh, doing for P.C. Chang in that moment was precisely to evoke this Confucian moral philosophy, which would then uh, grind, uh, which would then uh, 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 give a different grounding to the idea of humanness. In other words, number two in that written character can be interpreted as plural. In other words, P.C. Zhang was trying to ground the concept of human rights not in the individual, but in the sociality of human beings. Number two, I wouldn't go too literally with number two. It could be three and four, since he was already known in the UN as someone who upheld pluralism. And so I translated, I decided, you know, it was not a good translation, you know, conscience was not a good translation, uh, nor is uh, uh, sympathy uh, a good translation. It doesn't come close to it because we really have to be uh, very literal about this Confucian concept that is plural. So I translated it as the human plural in place of conscience. Now, what's so interesting is that if you read the Chinese version of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that concept is brought back in two characters that are not this Ren, but that were used by Mencius millennia ago to interpret Ren, that difficult term which they couldn't translate. So fascinating. Um, so more quickly, uh, we have about a minute left. Uh, so it appears that the idea of human rights um, must be universally supported. Western powers, all of them, must have been for the Declaration 
uh, of human rights? Uh, or were there some oppositions as well? Well, uh, of course, during the drafting process, they had many debates, um, but then miraculously, they managed to pass it, they approved it at the UN in the fall of 1948. But that didn't mean anything because they realized this was just a do moral document. They wanted to move on to some covenants which would make some of these principles legally binding. So they were discussing uh, political and civil rights. And two years later, in 1950, uh, uh, the Belgian delegate decided to add a colonial clause to the covenant. That colonial clause was supported by France, Britain, and even the United States, surprisingly, because they wanted to make sure that uh, in the face of decolonization that was going on around the world, uh, human rights and this declaration would not automatically apply to colonized people. So fascinating. I mean, this is this is very remarkable and startling news that the colonial powers were against self-determination uh, of people. Thank you very much for being on the show. And thank you for joining us on International Focus. We'll see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website.